So, uh, hello and welcome uh, to people here, and also welcome, since as we do these days, we're also streaming this around the laboratory, so <laughs> to, to the distributed laboratory, so, um, and we'll uh, stay close to our microphones. I should say we actually have the new sound system in this room, so that it can, uh, when we do have Q&A, it can pick you up wherever you are, so we don't have to run around with microphones anymore. So this is so uh, welcome everyone to this uh, third event in the Directors Distinguished Women in Science Speaker Series. Uh, this is uh, grew out of, but uh, 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 our initiative on diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it's also part of our celebrating uh, the impact of science on society. We've been honored by two remarkable researchers to date, Jennifer Doudna and Jerry Richmond. Uh, so this time we needed to get someone who wasn't a chemist. That was a requirement. <laughs> uh, today I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, who is a geophysicist who has led some of the most important scientific institutions in this country. Uh, the members of the National Academies of Science, of Engineering, and of Medicine represent the most accomplished researchers in the country. And Marcia McNutt was the first female president of any of the academies when she began serving as president of NAS uh, three years ago. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and from my point of view, and it's time for the other two academies to catch up. But uh, and just three years into this role, she has become a leading advocate for science in an age of skepticism about science at a time when science's voice has been um, uh, perhaps muted, perhaps uh, uh, over, uh, you know, uh, have other voices that have been louder. Um, it, she has been a front runner in helping to shape US science policy. I have had the honor and pleasure of serving on the National Academies Committee on Science and Public Policy, and I am sure we will touch on some of those issues in our conversation today. From 2013 to 2016, Marcia served as editor-in-chief of the science family of journals, as many of you know. She played a major role in building out what AAAS calls the front half of the magazine, which communicates the excitement of science to everyone, not just the technical experts. As one colleague observed, this has made a huge difference in the way that our communities have understood their opportunities and responsibilities for engaging with the public. Then, before that, um, in 2009, President Obama invited Marcia to join the group of scientists who were taking on leadership roles in the new administration. That included Steve Chu, Jane Lepchenko, uh, and John Holdren. And she served as director of USGS, the US Geological Survey, for four years. And as we'll talk a little bit about, USGS responded to a number of major disasters, including earthquakes uh, in, in Haiti, Chile, and Japan. Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And uh, Marshall led a team of government scientists and engineers at BP headquarters in Houston who helped contain the, the, the oil and capped the well. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, as part of our discussion. But before even that, uh, uh, Marsha McNutt was a local leader serving as president and chief executive of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, and oversaw their, uh, their research. And uh, uh, she was one of the people who made that transition at that point in her career from being a full-time scientist to being a leader of science. And, um, and uh, she did a remarkable job of identifying what made, um, uh, what, what were the opportunities of that institution and, uh, and leading it into the future. But in the end, She's a scientist. She's a marine geophysics as her background. And uh, she began her faculty career at MIT, where she became the Griswold Professor of Geophysics and directed the Joint Program in Oceanography, a course of study offered by MIT and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, her own research focuses on the dynamics of the upper mantle and lithosphere on geologic timescales. And she's had a, a remarkable career um, and many major ocean cruises, of course, was her. So uh, she was the first woman to lead the NIS, the first to direct the USGS, the first woman to run the prestigious journal Science, the first to lead MBARI. So you get the pattern here. 
Uh, and, and perhaps the first one to roar into the MIT parking lot on a fiery red motorcycle to teach her course, I've been told. <laughs> and she also has a passion for fast horses, and you can find out on the web about her, uh, uh, her, her uh, riding there. So she has received numerous accolades, and uh, one of them is as a role model for young scientists everywhere. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the president of the National Academy, Dr. Marsha McNutt. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, what I, I thought we'd do is I'm going to, uh, I have some questions that I think are the questions that you would be asking if you're here. So I'll to get this started and we'll do this for a while. And then at the end we'll have some chance for uh, people around the audience to ask well. So let me uh, start a little bit at the beginning. So. Um, uh, you were a physics major when you started. Yes. Uh, so as a physicist, that, I pay attention to that. So what led you to make that choice? Well, I think that um, when I was in high school, I went to an all-girls school practically my entire life. And I had this amazing teacher in high school, Mrs. Hill. And there were only four girls in my class who took physics. And she just made us adore physics. And I'm, I'm sure there are so many scientists here in this room who think back to that one teacher who was such an amazing role model and had such an incredible impression on them. And for me, it was Mrs. Hill. She taught me calculus in high school and she taught me physics. And physics just seemed so beautiful. I loved the fact that uh, it wasn't sort of, it wasn't kind of. It had rules, it had laws. I, I just, I adored physics and I could imagine nothing better than yeah. being a physicist. Okay. So then you, for graduate school, you went to Scripps. Yes. which is this great institution at, at UCSD, but although it actually predates UC San Diego. Yes. It was the institution around which UC yes. San Diego grew. It was, yes. uh, Scripps okay. Institute of Oceanography. And this must have been a very exciting time. Yes. Uh, so what, what did you work on and why? Right. So um, when I was about to graduate from uh, college uh, with my degree in physics, I had uh, been thinking about, well, my, my fa the faculty at Colorado College had encouraged me to go to graduate school. My plan had been to go to Sun Valley and be a ski bum. But, Not a um, bad plan. <laughs> but, but they had other ideas and convinced me I should go immediately to graduate school. So, uh, but, but my, my advisor, uh, Dick Hilt, said, you know, uh, I don't think he said you should go to graduate school in astronomy. He said, people are lining up for telescope time. And he said, I don't think you should go to graduate school in high energy physics because uh, people are waiting for time for these new accelerators to be built. But he said, here, read this, and he handed me the very first article it was written in Scientific American, and the first article that was written for a popular audience on plate tectonics. Oh. And it changed my life. I had taken geology courses at Colorado College, and um, I loved doing science outside, adored doing science outside, but I wasn't intrigued by geology as a career because it seemed so arm wavy. All the beauty that I loved about physics because it was so simple and so perfect was lacking in geology until I read that article by John Dewey. And plate tectonics, there it all was. It was all laid out, this simple theory for everything on Earth, for volcanoes, for earthquakes, for mountain ranges. And so I said, oh, well, now I know what I have to do. I have to go to an oceanographic institution because all the plate boundaries are underwater. 
And that is where I will combine physics with um, understanding the Earth. And so that's what okay. I did. Okay, good. So, uh, well, it, it worked out well. <laughs> and which uh, got you to uh, MIT on the yes. faculty there. And your uh, research really, that's really when you made your career in research, in some yes. sense, really. Um, uh, you were also raising three young daughters as a single parent at that time. And I think, uh, I certainly, how did you manage to do all that? Uh, I think uh, I would sort of like to understand that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, um, so my uh, husband died uh, very um, suddenly when my oldest daughter was six and the twins were two. So uh, I remember at first thinking that, um, uh, you know, just thinking that I didn't know how I was going to go on. Yeah. Um, it was uh, it, it was very difficult to think how I was going to manage everything. And um, you know, Bob Bergeno here was uh, dean at MIT at the time. Uh, Tom Jordan was my uh, department chair, and um, you know, everyone at MIT was very, very um, helpful. And I got some good advice. Um, someone told me, don't make changes in your life. Don't make, don't make sudden changes that are going to add to this sudden change. So um, I decided, I had thought, how am I going to keep my home? Um, how am I going to uh, continue to raise these kids all by myself? But I made minimal changes possible. Um, one thing that was um, really fabulous was we had a wonderful um, nanny who had come to live with us uh, years before, and uh, she stuck with me no. through this entire time. So the kids still had Basically, they're two primary caregivers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. me and, um, and their nanny. And um, we just um, made it through. Yeah. No. Well, um, you, it, it turns out uh, you made this fantastic career, then, and then, but then after a while, you did make a big change. Yes. <laughs> that is, you, uh, you know, in the middle of that career as a, uh, a research faculty, you decided to uh, move to uh, Monterey and become director of Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I had one of those changes when I went from being a faculty member at Santa Barbara to being director of Fermilab. Although I moved from Santa Barbara to Illinois, and I see you moved from Cambridge to Monterey, so you may have gotten something right there. <laughs> um, but um, uh, but at least I know uh, something about that situation yeah. of making what, in some sense, you know is going to be a big change yeah. in your life to move to that from your own research to helping other people with their research. So, uh, what? How did you think about that? Yeah. So that was that was an agonizing decision. Uh, I had so many people tell me to even consider leaving MIT was was career suicide, that I must be out of my mind to even think about it. Um, by that time, my children were in junior high school, and uh, you know, basically, the Boston area was all they had ever known. Uh, I loved MIT, loved my students, loved the people I worked with, but I had been there a long time. And so um, I, and I thought, can I possibly adjust to going from doing my own research, which is, frankly, the greatest thrill you can ever get, to solve problems yourself and think, wow, I discovered this. That is so exciting. To a different situation where you're in research management, and so you have to somehow get your um, satisfaction vicariously by enabling other people's research. But I thought, you know, 
I've, I've done this for 15 years, and look at all these students that I've turned out, and maybe I need to do something else. The other thing that went through my mind is I noticed, and you were part of this, Michael, you invited me to come and be on, I believe at one point, uh, well, you and other people were inviting me more and more to come and advise yeah. other people on yeah. their research programs. Yeah. And I realized yeah. what people are more interested in learning from me is my advice on their research. Yeah. Yeah, so rather so, than and, my research. And that's right. When I was first vice chancellor, the first thing I did as vice chancellor is we had a, the largest institute reporting to me was the Marine Science Institute. Yeah. And of course, the first thing I did was have a review of the Marine Science Institute and brought in a group of distinguished people, yeah. including Marcia came in, and it changed, it changed the way we went with that Marine Science Institute as a result of that review. So right. that was the first So I realized that people yeah. really, what they care more about from me is not about my own research, but my opinion of everyone else's research. And I thought, he didn't pay me for that. In fact, <laughs> no one no one pays me for my advice on everyone else's research, as long as I'm a faculty member here at MIT. But if I actually went into research leadership, now I'm actually getting paid. That is my job, to actually advise people on their research. So maybe I should actually go do a job where I'm getting paid for what other people think. You're, you're I'm giving up our good secrets at. now. <laughs> yeah, so so that's what I did. I went there and it actually and in, in terms of the family, my yeah. children thought that they were at the time moving into Beverly Hills 90210 because they just thought California was all, you know, one big television show. So that worked out. So then you, you, you had a good long tenure at, uh, at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, yes. about 10 years. And, yes. and uh, then um, Sean Solomon, who is a well-known, distinguished uh, uh, scientist, contacted you because he was working at the National Academy to think about who might lead USGS in the next administration. Yes. yes. And one thing led to another, and you ended up actually getting a call about leading USGS. Yes. Yes, so uh, what had happened was um, Sean Solomon um, was put in charge of the National Academies Committee to recommend um, the next director of the USGS under the Obama administration. And so they put together, he called me up and at first he said, um, we're just putting together a long list of people who would be willing to talk to the administration about taking on this job. That's a you, slippery slope. Yes, <laughs> yes, you, you've been there. Yeah, so you don't have to be, you don't have to say that you take the job, you don't have to say that you're eager to do it, all you have to say is that you're willing to talk to the administration about it. So um, I thought to myself, I, I'd been at Ambari, you know, uh, almost 12 years by that time, so I thought, okay, well, I, I'd be willing to talk to them. Little did I know, how persuasive a person Ken Salazar could be. Oh, my goodness. And not only that, but he had a secret weapon, who was Frank Press. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And, and Frank Press, who was uh, still in Washington yeah. at that time, was also uh, equally um, persuasive in telling me that I needed to do that job. So anyway, that's where I ended up. Yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, when you showed up at USGS, you know, uh, from outside, what did you find? What was it like? Well, uh, first of all, I was uh, totally pleasantly surprised um, at the USGS. It was just full of these um, wonderful scientists who adored the USGS. Um, you know, you hear sort of on the outside about um, government workers who maybe are uh, taking advantage of working for the government or whatever. Oh my God, that was not the USGS. These are people who, even after they retire, come to work every day. These are people who ignore shutdowns to come to work. These are people who adore their job. The USGS had more 50-year pins than any other organization in government, even though they are by far one of the smaller organizations. 
And that's because people come to the USGS, they love it, and they stay there. When I was USGS director, I actually gave out a 70-year service pin. Wow. 70 years. <laughs> I have not done that. 70 years. <laughs> so, so these are people that just love the agency, they love the mission, um, and they worked hard. They worked hard for the mission of the USGS. So that was. Then at USGS, you had a few events. Uh, yes. And, and why don't you, you might. To remind people what so, they were. So oh. my friends at NOAA started calling me the master of disaster. No. Uh, and that name stuck um, because I started um, in like early November and then January was the Haiti earthquake. And then I had, um, after Haiti, there was um, the... Um, uh, Icelandic eruption, Ayafjat mm. Laujukl, and then there was um, Deepwater Horizon. There was oh well, I forget the exact order. The Chilean earthquake, Chilean, yeah. Chilean earthquake. Um, there was the uh, Japan earthquake with the nuclear um, uh, Fukushima meltdown. Um, there was um, Superstorm Sandy. Um, there was, uh, uh, I mean, an endless string of disasters. There, um, the, the West burned up, floods in the Midwest, the first time ever that every spillway was opened in the Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi um, river system. They even blew the levees in the Bird's Foot Delta with explosives that had been buried since the 1930s that flooded the farmlands in uh, the Bird's Foot Delta. So there, there wasn't anyone even alive that remembered that those explosives were there except for the USGS. So. Well, and, and probably the most uh, sort of visible to the outside world of all those was the Deepwater Horizon. Yes. And uh, you had a central role in that. So uh, what was it like in the, at the middle of crisis management? So I think of, of all these um, disasters, of course, the Deepwater Horizon affected me the most. Uh, I remember a, a couple days after the well blew, and before anyone really had their arms around the magnitude of the disaster, um, Secretary Salazar, um, put me on a plane and took me with him down there to assess what was going on. And we went to um, New Orleans, we went to Mobile, we ended up in um, Houston for what was going to be a three-day tour of the disaster areas. When we got to Houston, he decided to leave me there to oversee the federal response and help um, BP uh, with um, containing the well and other issues that were going on in BP's uh, crisis command center uh, because he knew that I had had um, a substantial experience in deep water intervention with all my time at Ambari because Ambari was sort of like a NASA for the oceans. We spent a lot of time with submersibles and uh, deep sea observatories and things like that. So he decided that I would be the right person there. So my three day trip to the Gulf uh, turned into a three month deployment at BP headquarters. Uh, and that's where I worked very closely with Steve Chu um, to uh, work on um, all the interventions that finally resulted in installing the capping stack that uh, closed in the well. Did it occur to you that this uh, might not be stoppable at during no. that time? Or no. was it no. clear along it was just a question of how to, right. how to do it? Right. We, we had a very um, ordered system of interventions lined up. And we were confident that one of them would work. Um, BP's view was that they were going to start with the ones that they felt were, uh, what would be the word? Um, the ones that they felt were lowest risk. Yeah. Um, but we were fairly sure that in the lineup, 
one of these was, was going to pay off. Okay. Yeah. So, so then um, you, you did a, a four-year tour uh, that was very, a rich four-year tour at USGS. Uh, and uh, soon after that, you became uh, editor-in-chief of science. Yes. Uh, which is familiar to many of the people here. Um, and so just to pick out one of the many things going on there, this is a period when um, the integrity of science was being questioned, uh, when the reproducibility of science was yeah. certainly, uh, papers were being, uh, re retracted papers were getting a great deal of attention. So um, uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like um, managing that. So I remember when I went to interview for the position of editor-in-chief of science, um, the committee that was choosing the editor said, what issues would you take on as editor-in-chief of science? And I said, I believe the most important thing that I can deal with is the integrity of science. And um, as editor-in-chief of science, my most important task would be to uh, worry about uh, this issue of reproducibility. Well, I, I was chosen for the job, but I remember Alan Leshner, who was um, the CEO of AAAS. He came up to me later, many years later, and he said, when you were talking about integrity of science and reproducibility, he said, I didn't think that, that, was, that there was a there there, that that was a really going to be an issue. And he said, I'm really glad that you took that on. And I'm really glad that science got out in front of that issue. Because after I became editor in chief, I raised some money from some private foundations. I invited Nature and some other journals to join us. And we started a campaign to look at what were the sources of irreproducibility in science and what we could do to get out in front of the issue. What were the um, issues that were of a computational nature? You know, simply bad statistics, inappropriate p-values, that sort of thing. What were the issues that had to do with actual you know, fraud, which is, is a very small part of it? And what were the issues that just have to do with complex systems? That some of the science just is dealing with um, not understanding what are the dependent variables and what are the independent variables when one goes in to try to understand, um, get, get your arms around a very complex problem such that you might assume you have controls over everything, and in the end, you really don't. And because you don't, there's hidden variability in your uh, experiment that, that you don't know exists. And although fraud is, is, as you say, rare in science, self-deception is not so rare. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's something that, um, though, uh, with careful, um, you know, we put out some very clear guidelines on things like um, blinding right. and things like that that can, can nevertheless help with self-deception. Right. So, so then in your um, most recently uh, left that job to become president of the National Academy of Sciences. So I should say in that role, uh, there's a committee on public policy that meets that I serve on that Alan Leshner is now chair of. Mm -hmm. And much of what we're talking about are these issues again. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that there's actually a, 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 a new advisory board for research integrity. So uh, what, what's that going to do? How does that work? Yes. Um, so um, the research board for um, scientific integrity actually hasn't been stood up yet, but no, it's, it's something but it's, that it's we're, still an idea. But, yeah, it's yeah. still an idea that we're talking about. Um, so what the idea behind this research board for scientific integrity, which has been actually recommended 
in several Academy reports um, over the years is the idea that um, there, it, it, there would be advantage to the research community to have a neutral place to go um, where a group of people worries about the, um, uh, the culture and the processes that uphold the highest standards for science on an enterprise basis. So right now, there are smaller groups that might deal with publishing ethics or that might deal with um, ethics for um, human subjects or that might deal with ethics for um, uh, different um, fields. But no group that looks across the entire, from the input funding to the output in the publications, as to how all these pieces fit together and work together. And the idea of this board is that it does not investigate complaints. It does not met out punishments, but it serves as a resource to everyone um, of how we can raise the tide for all ships to improve the um, quality of what we're putting out. Okay. So, so you've had this very rich career. So out of that, look, uh, what, what, what was the most important event or events in shaping that for you? Yeah. Uh, so um, it was interesting. Um, when I was down in Houston and um, we finally capped the well and um, managed to um, do a, a static kill because it was no longer flowing, there was a young Coast Guard officer um, who asked me as I was sort of packing up things uh, because it was finally time after more than three months in Houston to uh, go back to Washington. Um, his name was Joe Kuzak. And he asked me, um, how has this oil spill changed you? And I remember thinking about it for a minute. And I said to Joe, I don't think it, 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 has, it has changed how I view how I'm going to spend my time because I don't think I will ever again be able to work on something that doesn't really matter. The oil spill had lifted up for me the importance of working on things that were really significant. Because that oil spill, I had seen how it affected the environment, how it affected people's livelihoods, how it affected the economy, how it had the potential to affect um, the uh, health of people in the region, how people were waiting um, for daily reports <coughs> on the flow rate, on opening of fisheries, et cetera. And I thought, um, this is science, informing, human uh, informing public policy that really matters. And I don't think I'd ever be able to go back to doing something that people didn't care about. That at most, there would be five people that would read and understand the paper, and that would be it. Yeah. Okay. So um, another thing at the National Academy that we've all been dealing with is, well, diversity of science, mm -hmm. diversity of the academy. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, and, and to some extent, I think that's something that I think, well, many of us, and, I, and you certainly have been dealing with through your career. Yeah. So looking at that from where you are now, uh, what, you know, what, what progress has been made? What progress hasn't been made? How do we make progress? Yeah. Uh, in the future. Um, so I'm totally convinced that uh, we have to double down the effort to make progress at all levels, everywhere we can. So uh, let me talk first just about the academy. Yeah. So um, at the academy, people will be probably surprised to hear that my council 
is more than 60% female. So, you know, when you think of the fact that the Academy is mostly a male organization, I think the membership is more than 80% male. When we have an election and we elect who those more than 80% men want to lead them, they want the women in the, in, sitting around the table making decisions. So you might ask, why is that? Why do they predominantly, when they get a slate of two candidates, they could ask this guy or they could ask this woman, who are they going to vote for to lead the academy? Why do they want the women? So, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure everyone here has their views. I've asked some men. Um, here's what I'm finding. Deep down, everyone, men and women alike, have had a variety of experiences with their fathers. But everyone tells me that mom gave everything for the family. And she would put her own needs last in order to make sure that the best decisions were made for her family. And so that's my thought about why the women are sitting around the table, because everyone trusts that they are not going to vote what's best for Stanford University, or what's best for the University of Chicago, or what's best for biology, or what's best for chemistry. They're going to vote what's best for the entire organization. Um, the other thing is, we are electing women to the National Academy in record numbers. Whereas it's less than 20% that are members right now, last year's class of new members was almost 30% women. And I think we're going to bust that number by an amazing amount um, this coming year. Okay. So I, I think that's very good. But I think the most important thing we've done for women is our new report on sexual harassment in science, engineering, and medicine that came out last June. This report is getting a lot of traction in um, not just in STEM, but in fields um, all, all across uh, academia, and is even being picked up outside of academia. I was sitting at dinner next to the head of the NCAA and talking to him about the report. And he said, wow, all of those issues we've got in the NCAA. And, and, and he immediately wrote down the URL of the report. And he said, we've got to read these findings, and we've got to take up these recommendations. So um, I, I think that until the culture changes, within institutions following the recommendations of this report, we probably will not have um, equity for women in our institutions. And so the academy is certainly practicing what it preaches. Uh, we have a new um, code of conduct, which not only deals with scientific misconduct, but also sexual harassment, bullying, et cetera and um, along with it, uh, an enforcement policy. So uh, we're excited. Great. So that was, that was going to be my, le my last question. So I would like to give uh, people in the room a chance to ask questions. As we said, uh, they actually can set up the microphones to pick you up now, he tells me. So um, we're going to ask for questions. So uh, Roger will start. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I guess my question involves the um, academies and their giving advice to the government. Yes. Um, so two recent issues that could involve the academy. First is um, the proposed review by the National Security Council uh, of the National Climate Assessment that mm -hmm. um, appears to be focused on engaging skeptics. Um, the second is 
the definition of sensitive topics uh, regarding national security, economic security, while still trying to maintain the openness of universities and labs. Yeah. So given those two topics, are those, are those kinds of topics that the academies would, would jump in on uh, uh, and, and, and help as those uh, processes are in place in other, as other parts of the government? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I would like to say more, but I'll, I'll just leave it. <laughs> okay, Mina. Um, I have two very specific questions, and I don't mean to take a religious time, but one question I have for you How did your father treat you? <laughs> And what is the significance of fathers in making daughters that can make a difference? Mm -hmm. I am a great believer in this. And I, one of the things that I have gathered, not enough statistics, but personal <laughs> statistics. And how was it for you? Uh, what child are you and how did your father um, okay. treat you? So I am the second of four daughters. There hadn't been a boy born on the maternal side of my family in years. Um, so I come from a very strong maternal line. Um, my uh, mother was fond of saying that my father couldn't say no to me. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> and because, because I didn't have a brother, I would say my father sort of treated me like his son. I was the one who got up at 5 in the morning and went out to the duck blind with him. I was the one that, you know, got up and, and mowed the lawn, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. And I uh, was treated very much like a boy. And uh, but I do think that fathers make a huge difference in how their daughters behave. Now, if I may, I have a question about MIT, yes. your alma mater. Uh, why does it have so few women after all of these years? And sec and there is another one which is even more important that the relation of people who have to withdraw their papers. And they have shown that the papers were made up. What does MIT do about those things? Do you know about these two? <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure I really can talk um, much about MIT policy. Um, I, you know, one, one thing I, I do think is that um, the system uh, one thing about this research integrity uh, advisory board we were talking about is how do we get more teeth into um, the process of retractions? Because right now, if a journal finds that work is flawed um, and, or, or su suspects that it is, and they request that a university do an investigation the journal can't do the investigation. They don't have access to the labs, to the people, to the notebooks, to anything. And what they find is that some universities do a really good job of getting in and, and getting to the, to the heart of the problem. Other universities have no incentive to do it because it's embarrassing to them. And, and so they do nothing, or they cover it up, or whatever. And so um, I, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I could, stories I could tell you from my time at Science Magazine of universities that hopped right to it, who got us great information, beautiful documentation that allowed us to write a great retraction of a paper, and other universities to this day that I've been, you know, six years out of science and still have know that the university has not given science the information to retract the paper. And I had to do editorial retractions oh, yeah. on those papers. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. I have a question about the role of the academies in guiding the government 
balance of funding for research, specifically uh, recognizing the academies are advisory, do not make policy. Right. What can their role be with respect to what we invest in space research versus other initiatives? Right. So, um, to my knowledge, I don't believe the Academy has been asked that question. Um, so the, um, just to be clear for everyone here, there, the Academy does not advocate for science or scientists or whatever. So we do not go out and say, there should be more money for science, or there should be more money for space research, or there should be more money for this, that, or the other thing. Because we want to um, be able to be viewed as a um, non-partisan, um, independent voice that if the government, in fact, as a real example, if the government came to us and said, what would the impact of a 10% increase of funding to science be, we could say honestly what the impact would be because we haven't said, oh, funding has to increase for science. Um, but to my knowledge, we haven't been asked the question, um, if funding were reallocated from this field to that field, what might the deleterious effects be on this field and what might the positive impacts on that field be? I, I haven't, yeah, yeah, I haven't and, seen and that. And many, of course, the, the National Academies do many of these studies uh, in fields, you know, the decadal survey right. for astronomy and for physics and for, but uh, to my knowledge, actually, I can't think of one where they were actually looking across yeah. the yeah. landscape of science that puts Board. and takes from one to the other. It's usually at the National Science Board level that those trades are made. But I, I, I honestly do not know of a case. No. Thank you. No. Other questions? Yes? In addition to significant work, what other advice would you offer for early career researchers? Uh, all right. Um, if, if I had to say, um, and I, I told this to the early career researchers earlier today, um, uh, one thing that um, certainly made a difference in my career was um, I think that far too many people plant their feet at one institution and stay there forever and don't get the advantage of different places, different organizations, new missions, um, new ways of thinking, um, new problems to solve. Uh, after I'd been at MIT and I went to Ambari, I realized I'd probably been at MIT too long. And when I left Ambari to go to the USGS, I realized I'd probably been at Ambari too long. Um, every time I moved to a new institution, it was almost like repotting a plant. It was like this adrenaline rush of new people, new ideas, new mission, new things to do. So I would say don't get um, so um, rooted in one place that you can't um, go forth and try something different. Okay, I, I think I'm gonna uh, uh, sort of chance to end on that note, because that was actually a, a good one. And I want to say, for one thing, uh, also, besides our this discussion today, Marcia did take care, uh, we uh, had her talk to some of the early career scientists this morning. And uh, so we, we've taken full advantage of her being here today. She's been working hard for us for free. And no, and, uh, um, uh, but I, I really want to. But, but all of you always work for me. That's what I say every time <laughs> yeah, or any place. Right. It's, it's all full of volunteers for the Academy. So on behalf of the Academy, thank you for all you do for the National Academy. So.
So please let us thank Mark. And I want to say uh, I, I thank you all for participating, both people who are here and streaming online. And uh, we certainly look forward to doing another one of these in six months or so uh, when we have the opportunity. Uh, but uh, this will be a, a hard act to follow. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.